Jones. This is just not a story, but a history. As best we could track down events. Jesse, please sit still. Okay. For instance, you'll notice the name of this film is One Man's Bayside. Now that title came from an old newspaper clipping out of the New York Carol Tribune. The reporter interviewed a 90-year-old man named Brinton Bell right here on Bell Boulevard. When you see his photograph, you might wonder, does Bayside really have a history? Famous men and women, old buildings, familiar sayings? Of course, Bayside has a history. Everyone and everything does. Just wait a minute. Here they come now. As you walk down the street, do you realize that you're a part of history? street of one town of one country on the face of this earth. His name is Brinton Bell, and he lived and walked on Bell Boulevard, Bayside, New York, USA. This very Bell Boulevard was named for his great-grandfather, the first Abraham Bell. spots to the old bell house where Brinton Bell lived for 95 years. An area where he was a part of the history or what we call the changes of Bayside from just after the Civil War to his death in 1969. This is one man's Bayside. school run by a Miss Faust who lived on uh, Rocky Hill Road and uh, our cousin Freddie Storm and uh, Fred Smart and his sister Lachin rode uh, an old gray horse belonging to my father bareback. Then my father sent us to the public school for also one Rocky Road. Uh, we were at recess, uh, uh, very much interested in uh, one of the larger boys that had a revolver. And we were all standing around uh, looking at this uh, wonderful instrument, and it accidentally went off and shot uh, Charlie Clark uh, through his, uh, his jaw, and he carried this car all through his life. A ten-year-old girl named Mary, she never signed her last name, wrote this composition in 1881. My school days. I was very delicate when I was young, so I did not attend school until I was eight years old. I have only attended the Bayside School. The names of my teachers, Miss Hume, Miss Bowes, and Miss Sinclair. I study spelling, geography, arithmetic, reading, history, grammar, and writing. My favorite is arithmetic. The Bayside School was built 1860, and since that time it has not been troubled with robbers until last year it was robbed several times. The clock, encyclopedia, and dictionary were taken. Our school has been altered a great deal since it was built. At first it only had one large room, and now it has three rooms. I think I excel more in history than any other study. The first bell that came to Bayside, Abraham Bell, my great-grandfather, was a, an English shipping merchant having a line of, a line 
kind of vessels uh, flying between London and New York and New York and South America. He came to this country, I believe, about the year 1800. His uh, ships would uh, come over from England with uh, a partial load, cargo, and uh, would unload in the lower end of Manhattan Island. And uh, when the ships were unloaded, they would sail up the East River to uh, what was then Mattock Garrison's Bay, now known as Little Neck Bay, and would sail up at high tide uh, to the alley. At that time, there was no meadowland. It was all open bay. and landfill for roads. And there are houses on all the hilltops. Someday when you're driving through the alley between Bayside and Douglaston, it might be fun to speculate on the first settlers who came to the Long Island shore. However, no one knows who was actually the first settler, but the area first settled was here. A small settlement at the head of the bay, on the banks of Alley Pond. This house was built in Queens just about 15 years after the first pilgrims settled Plymouth Rock. The address, Thomas Foster, Alley Pond. The Alley Pond had a grist mill in 1752. The Flushing Alley Post Office was started in 1821, 10 years before what is now Flushing had postal service. In fact, it was a thriving settlement for a most startling reason, common sense. Seawater reached the wagon trail which connected the rural area of Hempstead Plain with the thriving train center of Manhattan via ferry boat across the East River. General store, it sold everything. No settlement was complete without it. Benjamin Lowry started a general store in the alley in 1828, just four years after Abraham Bell arrived at Little Neck Bay to have his ships overhauled. A few years later, Lowry's son-in-law, William Bierman, took over, and for over 100 years, three generations of Biermans ran that general store. Even today, you might catch an old-timer still speaking of Bierman's Alley. And now there is just an old wagon trail leading from Northern Boulevard to the high ground near the Long Island Expressway. All the buildings were destroyed in the early 40s during the construction of the Cross Island Parkway. Uh, in the year 1824, my great-grandfather thought that Bayside was a, be a desirable place to locate a home. And he purchased a tract of about 224 acres from uh, Timothy Matlock. And he paid $117,000 for the tract of land. He built a 
residents on the shore. A generation later, the Bells had moved to what was known as the upper half of the Bells' farm. Brenton Bell's grandma lived in this house. The road, which is now called Bell Boulevard, ran right in front of that house. It was the dividing line between the upper and lower farm. Br Brenton lived just a few doors away. Oh, certainly there were parties and visits with grandma, but not all the time. In fact, grandma kept the household records in an account book. This particular book was started in 1892. Now, an account book is similar to a checkbook, which many people have nowadays, because both keep a record of how the household money is spent. For instance, September 26th, 1892, roast beef, $2.60. And look here, December 10th, 1892, two vests and two drawers for Willie. Now, that's one of Britain's brothers. Uh, $8. Drawers are underwear, you know. December 31st, 1892, Christmas turkey, $5. And on May 29th, 1893, Dr. Miller, for putting in two teeth, $6. On that same day, bread cost eight cents a loaf. For Britain's expenses over a two-year period, tuition for school, clothing, doctor bill, $838.24. In effect, we're beginning to understand Grandma through the records she kept. It's a picture of a capable and prudent woman. Today, many women work in businesses, schools, offices, and stores. Maybe your mother or grandmother has some work outside the home. But in the days when Brinton Bell was a little boy, most girls and ladies worked only at home, as the laundress, seamstress, or perhaps governess. His grandmother sat in a rocking chair and made quilts, over 40 of them. She gave all those beautiful handmade quilts away to her children, to her grandchildren, to her friends. She even gave one to the wife of this president of the United States, who is Benjamin Harrison. According to local newspaper accounts, President Benjamin Harrison, in turn, thanked Mrs. Bell by writing her an autographed letter. She must have been proud of those quilts, as she kept a diary of each one that she made. About the president's quilt, Grandma wrote, This quilt is made of Sura silk, colors old rose and blue. It contains 14 yards. It has 131 yards of straight work, 12 yards of chain work, one square yard of small shells in the center, 33 feathers and 10 stars. It was finished on the 4th of July. Every stitch was done by my own hands and the needle was threaded 779 times. But Grandma Bell did not sit in her rocking chair every day. Known as Eliza Hoff Bell Sr., she was one of the founders of a college. It was an unusual thing to do for a lady who lived in the 19th century. The college is called Swarthmore in Pennsylvania. Brenton Bell attended the college, which was founded by people who followed the Quaker religion or the Society of Friends, as this group is rightly called. in tricorn hats and feathered headdresses. If you look very carefully at this oil painting, you will see white men signing a treaty with the Indians. But what is this little child doing in the picture with his arm around a lion? That is something of a secret. The man who painted these pictures was a member of the Quaker religion, as was Mr. Bell. His name was Edward Hicks. He was a descendant of the family that settled central Long Island, that gave the town of Hicksville its name. Edward Hicks tried to tell what his religion said about the New World, about America. This is the peaceable kingdom, he said. The lion lies with the lamb, and a little child shall lead them. The Quakers did not believe in fighting wars under any circumstances, only peace. Only in the new world would the lion lie with the lamb.
the side street of Bayside that is over 100 years old. It is called the Lawrence Family Burial Ground. The Lawrence family was a friend of Grandma Bell's and of a great aunt before her. For several generations, they were neighbors in Bayside. Here and there, a Lawrence married a Bell. Yeah. 
1904, my father sold 97 acres to the Rickett Finley Realty Company uh, uh, for $1,000 an acre. And uh, they developed the property under the subsidiary name of Belcourt Land Company. They sold the entire tract within a year and made a net profit of $225,000. The Belcourt development was such a success that the Rickett Finley Company uh, then purchased Douglas Manor. And uh, they asked me to continue my connection with their company as uh, manager of the construction. Flushing man uh, lived on the corner of Bowen Avenue, Northern Boulevard. I can't think of his name now. And he says, uh, Bill, hitch your horse to the tree there and get in. I want to buy some real estate. <laughs> wow. So I got in with him and we drove around and they, I sold him a hundred feet front on the shore, facing the bay, for a thousand dollars a lot. And I got ten percent. Commission. All right, there's a lot of money to make at one time, and it's so easy. 477 people lived in Bayside in 1872. By 1922, the population was 6,500. Population flows along the lines of least resistance. Good roads, tunnels, and trains made the difference. The population in 1975 was approximately 100,000 and growing faster than ever. Fonda, as I recall his name, uh, brother of Henry Fonda, Henry Fonda, Henry Fonda uh, came into my office one day and said that uh, they wanted to establish a uh, uh, moving picture uh, outfit on the uh, uh, Jamaica States and all of the property from Jamaica States, all of the farms uh, between myself to list up all of the property that they wanted. And uh, instead of buying that property, they had decided to go to California. So uh, I didn't make the sale. Was it the scenery and cheap land or the lack of rain for outdoor filming which induced movie makers to move west? the reason, the film colony moved to Hollywood rather than Bayside. Yet many celebrities and theatrical personalities remained. On the corner of 222nd Street at the end of 35th Avenue, there once lived the heavyweight boxing champion of the world, Jim Corbett. Corbett won his title from John L. Sullivan in 1892. He was one of the first scientific fighters. The night of the Corbett-Sullivan fight, he noticed the ring was of turf instead of boards. So he stepped out of his shoes to see if his feet would hold. He started dancing around and found that his shoes didn't slip at all. But ever since that night, the custom of dancing was followed generation after generation of fighter. In those days, it was the style for the rich and the poor to try to dress as well as they could. Just to today, both rich and poor alike wear blue jeans or Levi's from almost every occasion. So Corbett, who did not wear the uniform of an ordinary street tough, but was rather a dapper dresser, became known as Gentleman Jim. Yet, because Corbett worked with youth and gave his time to charity, many Bayside's prefer to think of him as Gentleman Jim for that reason. This movie star, Pearl White, also owned a home in Bayside. She starred in a three-year series of silent films called The Perils of Pauline. 
frightening dangers, mounting tension. Each week you paid, each week you paid one nickel to see 15 minutes of an adventure story which stopped just at the moment when there seemed no escape. You had to come back the following Saturday to see what would happen. This is what's known as a cliffhanger. Pearl White sold her home to John Golden, a famous Broadway producer. Golden was so thrilled with the good fortune of having a lovely house and property that he willed the land of the, to the city of New York for use as a park, primarily for younger children. Listen to an old Edgar Bergen, Charlie McCarthy radio program.
1969, age 95. This is one man's Bayside. People change, places, time itself all change. The story goes on. We watch, we wonder, we change too. Only history continues.